Thank you everyone for being with us this evening for our Sierra Club New York City Group event. Sierra Club is the largest, oldest grassroots organization in the United States. Our National Sierra Club core values are anti-racism, collaboration, justice, and transformation, along with the basic tenets of Sierra Club of enjoying our outdoors and enabling our citizens to get outdoors and protect nature and creation. My name is Catherine Skopik. I am chair of Sierra Club New York City Group and of the sustainability series, which has been going on for several years. And this evening is our December 6th sustainability series event. Uh, and it is called Seeing Versus Believing. And we are curious to learn about how the media is covering climate and how citizens and people learn about the status of climate. Carl Palmquist is our vice chair and Carl has organized this event. And Carl, I hand it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, thanks to everyone who's here right now for joining us uh, tonight, to everyone who watches this after the fact, thank you for listening to the recording and thanks so much to our panelists uh, for partaking in this. We're really excited to have this conversation tonight. I'm Carl Pompus, Vice Chair of the Sierra Club New York City Group. I'll be moderating, moderating tonight's panel for our December Sustainability Series event. We're excited to welcome our two guests, Dr. Jennifer Marlin and Dr. Genevieve Gunther. Uh, and we're also excited to present a recording from Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney later this evening. Although many of the solutions to climate change are advertised as new technologies, pioneering innovations, many solutions that we hear less about are those in the social realm. How we change systems and how we communicate the seri seriousness of an issue effectively. In the realm of communication, the general public faces misinformation, disinformation, and greenwashing, making the facts hard to discern. Our experts tonight focus on these questions and more, trying to understand how the public views climate, why the, they feel the way they do, and what we can do to be better communicators of climate change. Our first panelist tonight is Dr. Jennifer Marlin, PhD. Uh, she is a research scientist at the Yale School of the Environment and the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. She obtained her PhD and MS in geography from the University of Oregon, Dr. Marlin uses a range of methods, surveys, experiments, and modeling to understand public perceptions of and responses to environmental change, particularly relating to climate and extreme weather events. Examples of her work include the Yale Climate Opinion Maps and a study of how hope and doubt affect climate change mobilization. Her work has been published in top scientific journals such as Nature Climate Change and Science, cited by publications like the New York Times, Forbes, and National Geographic, and is used by scholars and practitioners around the world. Dr. Marlin, would you like to start us off? Sure, thank you so much, Carl and Catherine and all of you listening and watching. I really appreciate you being here and I'm very excited to be able to share some of the research from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication tonight. Um, and our group, uh, we like to think of ourselves as small but mighty. Um, we collect survey data from around the world and I think you'll find a lot of it has interesting insights for thinking about what other people are thinking about when it comes to climate and how much has misinformation and actual information gotten out there? What is the state of public understanding of climate change? So can you all see my screen? Okay. Okay, great. So uh, let me get started here. And I want to start with some statistics uh, because we have been studying climate change for about 13 years now. Twice a year, we conduct nationally representative surveys. And we have found over this, over time, five key gaps in public perception about what scientists think and what we know to be real versus what people perceive. Um, and those five key facts are one, that this is a real problem. The earth is warming, it's already warmed 
um, about one degree Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit. And it's warming at a rate faster than has been occurring in tens of millions of years, right? We know this. And so 76% of American adults agree um, there is still about a quarter or so who say they don't really know, or, or a few that say uh, it's, not, it's not actually warming. The second key fact, we know what the cause of this warming is. It's human activities. Virtually certain that human activities, especially burning coal, oil, and gas is causing the planet to warm up. 58% of Americans say it's mostly human caused. So a majority, but still a lot of room for improvement. Number three, this is a serious problem, not just for future generations and for island nations or for polar bears, but for us right now, all around us in New York City, on Long Island, in Connecticut, around the world. And 55% uh, say that they think people are being harmed in the US right now. So also, also a gap there. Four, scientists agree about one, two, and three. You've probably heard 97% of scientists agree about one, two, and three. But when we survey the public, we find that only 55% understand how strong the scientific consensus is, that most scientists agree. And in fact, we've asked people, tell us what percentage of scientists you think agree that human-caused global warming is happening. And the right answer there is 97%. But only one in five people, about 21% of the public, will give you an answer above 90%. Mm -hmm. So there is a big gap there. People are still very confused. They think there's a lot of debate going on. Um, and they, they don't understand that the strength of the scientific consensus on climate change is as strong as it is between smoking cigarettes and getting lung cancer. It's, it's, it's virtually certain. The last key fact um, that we've studied for a very long time, and that is that this is a stubborn number, but the, the question about hope that we can actually solve this problem, that we can reduce global warming um, and that we have the a capacity at least to do so. About 42% agree. That doesn't mean 42% think that we're going to reduce it, but 42% at least think that we are able to if we put concerted effort into that. So these numbers can be a little disheartening, um, but there are some, some reasons for hope. Um, and I want to take you back to 2015, six, six years ago now, um, and even before this, but this is, this is a good benchmark. In 2015, we uh, segmented the American public into six different groups and they range from people who are alarmed about climate change. These are people who say, yes, it's serious, it's happening, it's urgent, I support action. 12% of the public back in 2015 were alarmed. 29% of the public were concerned. They thought it was a serious threat, but didn't think it was necessarily urgent. 26% were not sure whether it was warming or not and what was causing it. 7% said, I don't know. 15% said, nah, it's probably not warming. And if it is, it's probably volcanoes or changes in solar output or radiation or something like that, El, El Nino maybe. And then 11% were dismissive. Fast forward to 2021 or to, to 2020 actually, look how these numbers have changed. Now 26% of the public are alarmed, a quarter. So that bubble here increased quite a bit. 29% are still in the concern category, but 19% are cautious, 6% are disengaged, 12% doubtful, and only 8% now are truly dismissive. And so it's important to see that these bubbles over here um, are quite small. There's more than 50% over here who are alarmed and concerned. But of course, these dismissive and doubtful folks are a very vocal and well-organized and well-funded group. Um, and if you're talking about the halls of Congress, they are overrepresented. Um, th these numbers are reflective of the public. So most people are actually quite, uh, quite alarmed or concerned about climate change today. And these changes have been 
happening, especially in the past five years. These are trend lines showing how the size of those bubbles have changed over time. And now you can see that for the first part of the decade, it was relatively flat. There's a lot of momentum right now. And most of the groups are actually not moving a whole lot, but the alarmed category is growing faster than any other category. So what's causing people to change their mind? I think a lot of us tend to think it's the extreme weather. We think about the media. How does the media connect climate change to our everyday lives? Well, in many cases, it's through the latest disastrous wildfire or catastrophic heat wave. Um, we have you know, more extreme weather events than, uh, than any of us would like. And so um, as our climate is shifting, uh, we're getting more and more extreme hot weather and less cold weather. But the climate is also becoming more variable. We're getting more heavy flooding in New York and in the Northeastern US, for example. My basement is flooding more than it used to. Our pipes are having to deal with more water um, than they are used to and on and on. But if we look at the survey data, we see that in fact, across the country in every state, people do in fact think that global warming is affecting the weather. So anything, any state that's yellow here means a majority of Americans agree that global warming is affecting the weather or only two states where we have less than 50% who say that. And if you look at the county level, even almost every county across the US, uh, we have a majority of people who think that global warming will harm people in the US. And that's usually because they're thinking about extreme weather. So extreme weather is definitely on people's minds. But when you say, do you think global warming will harm you personally? When you really bring it home and make it close and personal, you don't even have a majority of people in most counties who think that they're personally being harmed by global warming. It's 40% it's in most cases, about 43% on average. Now, newsflash, everyone is already being harmed by global warming. We just don't really realize it because it happens in bursts and episodes due to extreme weather. But we don't realize that um, we're, many of us are dealing with worse air pollution or worse allergies because when you have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, plants produce more pollen and that aggravates your allergies. Um, it can also aggregate, uh, aggravate asthma. And many of us, like I said, are dealing with more intense flooding, higher extreme heat dates. Las Vegas was over 120 degrees for like two weeks this past summer. I have a lot of family who live there. It's becoming unbearable. So it's not actually extreme weather that's making people change their mind because people still aren't connecting that to climate change. In fact, what is making people change their mind are you <laughs> and organizations like the Sierra Club. It's people taking action, doing things. It's well-organized, increasingly well-planned strategic advocacy and activism. Um, and New York Renews is just one example of uh, a, an organizational push that took a lot of data, including data from our surveys and from our maps to try to understand where do they need to get action? What policies should they pursue? And they found out you know, what people around the state of New York wanted to do, where was their support and what do people want? They did a lot of grassroots act, um, act uh, organizing and they formed a very broad coalition. And so it's this grassroots organizing and data-driven approach that is really driving um, people to change their mind because people are reaching out and they're looking around and seeing what people like you are doing. You are educating yourself, you're connecting with others, other like-minded people, and you're doing everything you can to try to make changes in your daily lives. And that is what is the most important thing, in fact. And sometimes it feels like those little actions may not be that meaningful or may not have as big of an effect as you want, but it turns out that they are nonetheless contagious. There's actually a research study by my colleague here at Yale who looked at the installation of solar panels in communities and found that when people install solar panels and other people see them and see them doing that, they're more likely to do it themselves. It's actually a contagious action. 
And smaller actions can have the same effect. If you order an impossible burger or you know, if you're um, driving an electric car, we're very attuned to what the people around us, especially if we identify with them a little bit, are doing. And so those actions have much bigger effects. It's very hard to measure this and to explain it and articulate it, but it is absolutely true. It really, they have cascading impacts. So all the little things you're doing are really important. Now, we often think about the political polarization, and it can be infuriating to see how deep and entrenched it is in, in the country among our own you know, family and friends and neighbors and so on. And it's true. So these survey data show that support for this issue as a priority for the president and Congress is surging among Democrats. It's increasing among independents, but it's flat among Republicans. Um, but this is sort of, a, a, you know, a political agenda and putting it in a political frame. But if you look to people's actions and what they're actually doing, um, this is a, a, an example, I think, that kind of puts a different light on it. Ford invested $11 billion and created 11,000 jobs to create this new electric version of the F-150, America's best-selling pickup truck. And they've, you can pre-order it, it's not available yet, but you can't even pre-order because they're sold out already. All the pre-orders are made and there is incredible demand for this. And this is a massive investment by Ford. Um, and in fact, the battery on this vehicle is so big that if you lose power in your house because of a hurricane or something, you can plug the car into your house and like run your refrigerator. So people love this. It, it builds self-reliance and independence. Conservatives love it. Republicans love it. People out West love it. Um, and so sometimes the politics is, seems worse than it really is because in fact, uh, many, many Republicans even, even conservative Republicans support clean energy, renewable energy, they support, and I'm looking at the red dots here now. These are showing you the percentage of conservative Republicans who support a whole range of different uh, climate-friendly energy policies, including setting energy efficiency standards for appliances in new buildings, um, providing tax incentive and rebates to support homeowners um, and others who want to you know, switch to these energy efficient appliances, even providing federal funding to put solar panels on public schools. All of those things have majority support among the most conservative among us. Um, so even though it's true that if you ask questions about what's causing global warming or do you believe it to be happening or do the scientists agree, you'll get great divergence. But when you talk about renewable energy, you often see, actually, we agree about where we need to go in many cases. So that is some good news. But now, now we also need to remember that um, some people are taking those actions, but not enough. We have a long way to go. And the only way we're going to get there is if we keep talking about it and having conversations and bringing people with us, bringing people along, our family, our friends, bringing it up in conversation because people are not talking about it. They're only 35% say they talk about it at least occasionally with family and friends and that's just not enough. Um, only 25% say they hear about it in the media at least once a week. If you're a news junkie and you like environmental news, then this seems like an outrageous number to you, but this is true. Um, most people are not consuming a lot of environmental news. They might hear about climate change when an extreme weather event happens, but you know those are happening in particular places around the country. And if you don't hear about it in the media and you're not talking about it with your family or friends, when are you going to hear about it? And if you're not hearing and thinking about it and talking about it, how are we going to get stronger action? So it's little conversations. It's a million, many millions of little conversations that need to happen. And that's why um, I'll encourage you to go look at this talk that answered by Catherine Hayhoe that answers the question, what's the most important thing that you can do as an individual or as a community leader or as an organizer? The most important thing that you can do is to talk about it. To fight climate change, you need to talk about it. And there are so many entry points now 
um, given that we have to convert so many of our vehicles, appliances, our, um, our food habits, our transportation habits, we need to be changing all those behaviors. There are plenty of things to talk about. Um, and I encourage you to watch this TED Talk. Uh, Catherine Hay was a wonderful, um, in incredible speaker, um, a, a Canadian evangelical climate scientist. Um, and she, uh, she, she explains why this is so important very eloquently. Um, so, and as you're talking about it, remember to ask people to take action. Um, ask them to go with you to a meeting, to go with you to watch, um, you know, someone speak about this issue, go with you uh, to join in trying to eat a little bit less meat or make the changes that you need to make in your, in your daily lives. Um, and of course, political organizing is among the most powerful behaviors. And what we find is that when we ask people, are you willing to take some of these actions? If you're talking to someone who is alarmed or concerned, you'll get majority of alarmed folks who say they're willing and many concerned folks as well. Um, so there are many, many people. And in fact, if you count up all the people based on our survey data, about 23 million people in the US are alarmed and about 1.5 million in New York City alone are willing to take action. One of the main barriers that people say is that I've never been asked. I've never been asked to take action. So it can be as simple as bringing it up, finding a way to raise it in conversation and encourage those um, around you to go ahead and, and take that action. Uh, when you're looking for a bit more inspiration, go to climateconnections.org slash locations. And there are these very short audio stories about local causes, solutions, students doing things, um, religious community leaders taking action in so many creative ways. It's happening all around you. And you can go here to listen to those stories of other people um, and see what they're doing in, in your own neighborhood. Uh, there's a link here also if you want to find out which of the Six Americas segment you fall into or if you want to share that with a friend and see if maybe they will surprise themselves or surprise you. There's a link here um, where you can go and answer just four questions and find out which group you belong to. Um, and then I just want to thank our, all of our supporters here and funders. And there's a lot more research on our website, of course. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Marlin. That was really awesome. Uh, really great data there that I hope we have a chance to unpack later sort of uh, with some of Dr. Gunther's work uh, in mind. So really excited to get some more questions in the chat. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, we'll be taking questions in the chat. We won't be doing uh, raised hands just for time. Uh, so please make sure you put your questions in the chat. And now we'll move on to Dr. Gunther. Uh, so, sorry, let me just pull that up. So Dr. Genevieve, Genevieve Gunther is an author, climate activist, and native New Yorker. An expert in climate communication and fossil fuel disinformation, she's the founding director of End Climate Silence and affiliate faculty at the New School, where she sits on the advisory board of the Tishman Environment and Design Center. Dr. Gunther also serves as an expert reviewer for the contribution of Working Group 3 to the IPCC's sixth assessment report. Her next book, The Language of Climate Politics, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Okay, great. I'll, I'll give it to you now, Dr. Gunther. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I want to say that I was going to give a kind of conceptual talk about the language of climate change and the sort of medium that we use to communicate climate and try to inspire other people into action. But having listened to Dr. Marlin's talk, I'm wondering whether I should elaborate and give my research um, into how you help motivate the alarmed and even the concerned into action. So I don't know if there's a way to like throw this out to the audience and get a vote. Um, would you like to hear a more theoretical discussion about the language of climate change or would you like to get some more practical advice about how to talk to people um, sure. to motivate them into action? Can you do yeah. both? Can I do both? <laughs> um, all right, well, let me, all right, why don't I just throw out my, 
what my research has found into how to motivate the alarmed into action. Maybe I'll talk about that for four minutes and then if, you know, and then go into my talk that I've prepared. And then if someone wants to ask me questions about it during the Q&A, um, I will be happy to elaborate. Does that sound good, Catherine? That sounds wonderful. Else? Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, great. So, um, you know, as Dr. Marlin said, the alarmed and the concerned are, you know, a fast growing category of uh, American with respect to the climate crisis. Um, but, you know, a very small fraction of those people actually take action to move our politics forward. Um, and uh, I sort of, in my research into climate communication, I kind of have tried to combine what I've learned from social science and psychology in this regard um, with what I know from my background as a Shakespeare scholar about classical rhetoric and theories about how language and narrative inspire people into action. Because actually in the English Renaissance, they didn't think of you know, literature as something you just consume for entertainment. They actually thought of it as a kind of technology that would um, change people's political disposition and teach them ethics and inspire them into action. And the reasons that they gave for this, I think are still true today. So I've tried to do a kind of synthesis of, you know, the kind of scientific or social scientific research into climate communication and combine that with this kind of Renaissance literature, literary theory and classical rhetoric. And what I am arguing is that this does, this kind of communication, which I'm about to recommend to you doesn't work with people who are simply just curious or disengaged, and it certainly doesn't work with the dismissive. This is something you might want to try with people who have already told you that they're really concerned about the climate crisis. Um, what you want to try to do is tell, talk about it in a way that will inspire a complex of three different emotions. And the first one is honestly fear. Fear is a very powerful motivator to getting people engaged with the climate crisis. And the way that you inspire fear is simply by telling the truth. Make it clear what will happen if we do not stop using fossil fuels for our primary source of energy. And if we do not stop um, essentially decimating natural ecosystems to um, produce you know, acres and acres of like palm oil <laughs> farms. So if we don't stop these kind of emitting practices, you need to talk about what's going to happen. And Dr. Merlin, this is something I would love to talk to you about in the Q&A, maybe if there's uh, a survey to be done to ask people if they think the climate crisis is gonna affect maybe not just them personally or future generations, but their children. That sort of median step I think might be interesting to study. At any rate, so you want to talk about these effects, but you don't wanna talk about them in this abstract way or as something that's going to be really far in the future. You need to talk about it in this really local and embodied way. So connect with people that are in your community and talk as Catherine Hayhoe recommends about what concerns all of you. You know, flooding in New York City is a huge issue already. And so you can talk about that, you can talk about, you know, what might happen to our agricultural systems, but try to make it concrete, try to give people a sense of what this might feel like in their bodies and try to make it as personal as possible. So that's step number one, to really be honest about what's going to happen to our children's generation if we don't stop using fossil fuels. But the research also shows that fear without some sort of sense of self-efficacy or target can be demotivating. It can be paralyzing. It can lead people to despair and then they just disengage. So what you need to do next is sort of you know, it doesn't have to be sequential. You can sort of do this kind of as a big complex depending on the conversation and how you might wanna improvise it. But what you wanna do at some point, at least in this conversation is turn your interlocutor's attention to the people 
who are blocking climate policy from being passed in governments, to the people who are promoting the fossil fuel industry, to the people who are working against this huge change that we need to make in order to you know, have a sustainable, livable world. So the emotion that you're actually trying to generate here is outrage. Outrage has been shown to be an incredibly powerful political emotion and one that actually fuels social movements. So what you wanna do is not sort of, like you want to talk about the effects of the climate crisis, but you don't wanna keep your focus on nature or some, you know, kind of disembodied force. You want to talk about actual people and what they're doing right now to prevent the changes that need to be made in order for us to have a livable planet in order to sort of transmute that fear into outrage. So those are the two emotions, fear and outrage. And then the third one that you wanna generate is not even hope necessarily, but desire. And this is where the Renaissance literary theory comes in. You want people to start to actively desire the world that we can make by this transformation, this transition out of an unsustainable fossil fuel system into a world where people are going to be healthier. Perhaps we can all get to work a little bit less. We can have longer vacations and slow travel. We don't necessarily need to be um, you know, we're going to have more money in our pockets, not everybody, obviously, but the vast majority of Americans are actually going to have more money in their pockets after we've made this transition, because they're not going to have to pay these outrageous and variable heating bills, electricity bills, and healthcare bills, because everyone's going to be healthier, and because renewable energy is actually cheaper <laughs> than fossil energy once it's installed. So there are these ways that you want to inspire desire, but not just discursively, you also want to inspire people to act now. You want to make yourself an example. And Dr. Marlin was talking about this, how contagious it is when one person puts solar panels on their roof, then suddenly someone else is like, oh, that looks kind of cool. I'm going to put solar panels on my roof. And so this idea, and you don't have to like, you know, shove it in people's faces, right? But this idea that you yourself are living in this way, and your life has tremendous meaning, and you still get to have fun. And in fact, like, it's better on this side. So come join us. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I recommend to you. And you know, for each of you need to figure out for yourself, like, how it might be meaningful for you to try to talk in these ways because you know no communication is effective unless it actually really listens to the person you're having a conversation with and meets them where they are so that I mean the first thing you have to do in these situations is really listen and really make the other person understand that you see them and you hear them and you probably have to address some of their fears and their you know misunderstandings and whatever so really you're going to spend a lot of time listening and then you'll know you'll understand what is the thing they might be most afraid of how would they be most outraged how would they get most excited about taking action so really it's, it's hard, you do have to improvise and you do have to listen and you're listening to listen, not just to wait to talk. Um, but that is my recommendation to you all about these conversations, which are so important because the more that we have these conversations, the more people will be unable to just turn away and pretend climate crisis isn't happening. And the more that we'll normalize that this is the work of our time to accept the climate crisis is real and to do this remarkable political and economic transformation that will not only give us a livable planet mostly, but will actually make our lives better in the interim and in the end. All right, so that's my spiel about how to activate people <laughs> who are already alarmed or concerned. Okay, now I'm gonna go to a kind of more theoretical level about the language of climate change in general. Um, and again, like I'm gonna gallop through a a lot of material. So please, I'm happy to elaborate on anything that I've said um, in the Q&A. Okay, so 
I'm, I don't really want to talk about language in general. I want to talk about the discourse of the climate crisis. So this discourse should be understood as a system with like interlocking components that all work together. So there's the language of science, the language of economics, of international relations, of activism, of narrative forms like tragedy or eschatology, like apocalypse literature. There's the language of psychology. There's the practices of journalism. There are academic research conventions. There's right-wing propaganda and so on and so on and so on. But all of these different elements are part of a system and they're all connected with each other. And they're also connected to the kind of dominant ideologies of our historical moment. So they all act together with these ideologies to produce a kind of set of assumptions with, that we use to understand the physical crisis of global heating, but also its cultural meaning and its politics. So arguably, the reason our politics are so stuck, I mean, we have nominal pledges to decarbonize from governments and businesses, but we don't have enough public pressure yet to actually force those stakeholders to make those pledges good and change the material power structure of our global society and decarbonize. The reason our politics is so stuck is that the codes and assumptions that we all share and actually across the partisan divide are those that justify the fossil fuel system as it is. And that means that we lack the shared codes and assumptions that will justify the transformation of our global economy into a system that will enable us to halt global heating. Like we all know we have to make this transformation because climate change is here and it's getting worse every day, but we don't have the story yet that really justifies that transformation aside from we don't like climate change and we don't want it to be happening. So I've drawn this point from the research of George Lakoff, who is a cognitive scientist who used to teach at the University of California, Berkeley. And he is the father of the communications technique of framing. So like when you talk about the climate crisis as a, climate, as a crisis of air pollution, or you talk about decarbonization as giving us you know, better clean air and water, you're framing the climate change challenge as something else. Okay, but he also has a concept of framing, which is sort of deeper and more complex than that. He also talks about frame systems or the conceptual structures that people have in their brain circuitry to understand environmental issues. And I think that these frame systems in his argument are like these codes and assumptions that I was talking about. And now in Lakoff's view, American voters have in their brain circuitry the wrong frames for understanding the real crisis of global climate change. And I was just quoting Lakoff there. The, as Lakoff puts it, our leaders, policymakers, and journalists lack the frames that capture the reality of the situation. So another crucial task for climate communicators then is to help dismantle our current frame systems and redesign them as it were, to enable people to grasp the real crisis of global climate change and its resolution. So part of the task is to look at these codes and assumptions. They're like a network of deeply ingrained, but only partially true beliefs that are shared socially without even thinking across a particular culture or historical people uh, period, excuse me. What these codes and assumptions do are justify the world as it is, making its political and personal practices seem inevitable as if they couldn't be otherwise. And the reason leaders, policymakers, and journalists, not to mention scientists, advocates, and me and all the rest of us, lack the frame systems to understand the real crisis of global climate change is that the ideology embedded in our very language is our current ideology, which is the ideology of the fossil fuel era, the intertwined economic and social systems that have caused global warming in the first place. So what we need to do is actually try to replace those fossil fuel ideologies with new paradigms for a post-carbon era making what Lakoff calls, and I quote, the effort to build up the background frames needed to understand the crisis and build up the neural circuitry to inhibit the wrong frames. 
Otherwise, climate communicators can actually all too easily reproduce fossil fuel ideologies in the very act of speaking, amplifying the distrustful rhetoric of fossil fuel interests. And I know this seems weird, but think about the little word we. So the little word we actually misleadingly produces a kind of universal guilt for climate change that acts as a kind of cover for the oil and gas companies and their collaborators in government who knew all along that they were causing climate change, but covered it up. I mean, think about it. Who is the we who is causing climate change? Is it the 3.5 billion people who live on less than $10 a day and whose emissions have stayed largely flat over the past 30 years, while the emissions of the wealthiest 10% on the planet have soared exponentially? Does this we include Greta Thunberg and all the youth activists fighting to preserve a livable planet for their future? Does it include our kids? No, of course not. So this little word, this mere pronoun serves to universalize the responsibility for the climate crisis when in truth, the responsibility for causing and continuing the crisis lies with the very powerful few who must be removed from power so we, the people who want to survive, can undo what they've built and rebuild the system. So indeed the word we shows how the language of climate change can say one thing, but implicitly produce a different and sometimes opposed political effect. It also shows why everyone who talks about climate change should attend to the way words convey meaning, not just in what they say, but in what they silently imply, which is kind of like <laughs> the title of this panel, like, you know, do we see it? And if not, isn't it still there? So literary critics use the term ambiguity to describe this capacity of language to say one thing and mean another, um, or to have a word be effective on several levels at once. So here's an example. Fossil fuel apologists have started to call wind turbines windmills. And this word windmills suggests that these turbines are sort of quaint little relics of 18th century technology. So not only does this word obscure how massive and futuristic these towers really are, it obliquely attempts to sustain the oil drill as the emblem of modern energy production. And in such ways, ambiguities help to produce and maintain ideological beliefs, and not least because they activate those beliefs underhandedly, so to speak, enabling them to remain unexamined and uncriticized. So studies in the psychology of climate communication have looked at these kind of implicatures, what they've called effective imagery for data about how diverse constituencies understand and interpret global warming. But we need not to just categorize, but also critique the ambiguities of our climate vocabularies as part of the process of building new deep frames for the decarbonized world. Um, this critique is necessary, especially to combat disinformation. For instance, as the Harvard historian Nomi Oreski showed in Merchants of Doubt, for many decades, fossil fuel interests purposely highlighted the term uncertainty in their climate messaging to lead the public to believe that scientists had doubts about whether or not climate change was real. What Oreskes didn't really get into is that they were able to use this word deceptively because it contains a fundamental ambiguity that allows it to be transferred from its scientific context through the big discursive system and get used to manipulative ends. So like most people define uncertainty as the state of not being sure. Like I'm uncertain what I want for dinner. So let me open the refrigerator and stand here and try to figure it out. But climate scientists sometimes use the word in that way, but they don't always use the word in that way. When they speak of the uncertainty of their science, they generally refer to the range or interval of possible outcomes that they can say a model predicts with confidence. Mm -hmm. Indeed, confidence in science is actually a synonym for uncertainty. Scientists can say that a model produces either an uncertainty interval or a confidence interval. Yet, you know, most people aren't familiar with this sort of specific disciplinary meaning of the word. So when scientists have talked about the uncertainty of their science in their climate communications, they've unwittingly conveyed that they weren't really sure about their findings and ended up amplifying fossil fuel messaging. 
So in a truly like fiendish act of appropriation, fossil fuel interests managed to unwittingly recruit scientists into inadvertently spreading doubt. Mm. Now, of course, fossil fuel interests no longer produce disinformation by manipulating ambiguous definitions of uncertainty. I mean, obviously climate change is here. It would be absurd to deny it. So at this point, they've revised their strategy. Now, oil and gas companies and their business and government allies acknowledge that climate change is real, but they downplay its dangers and advance false solutions while they misrepresent themselves as partners in the clean energy transition. So let me repeat that. They acknowledge climate change is real, but they downplay its dangers and advance false solutions while they misrepresent themselves as partners in the clean energy transition. This messaging revolves around a constellation of seven key terms which now dominate the language of climate politics. Alarmist, cost, freedom, growth, India and China, innovation, and resilience. And like, you know, these are the sort of higher level terms, like for example, with cost, you can also have sort of like costing jobs or gas prices or taxes going up. But like the, the idea is that you, you emphasize the kind of overall cost of climate policy. So it's not just simply that word, it's this sort of term that allows for sort of, you know, variations in messaging. But those are the seven key, like, areas of fossil fuel messaging right now. And these terms come up in all sorts of arenas, scientific reports, policy briefings, political speeches and press releases, economics research, court cases, corporate memos, oil and gas advertisements, debate transcripts, newspaper and television commentary, news media reporting, and on and on and on. The language of climate change circulates through these platforms. That is the media of this discourse, this system that I'm talking about. And these seven key terms shape a misleading narrative repeated in fragments and sometimes in its entirety by both sides on the supposedly partisan climate change divide. And the narrative goes something like this. I'm almost done. Yes, climate change is real, but to say it threatens human survival is alarmist. And anyway, decarbonizing our economy would cost too much. The health of American families and human welfare around the world relies on economic growth partially enabled by fossil fuels. So we need to keep using fossil fuels and deal with residual emissions by increasing our innovation and deal with climate damages by increasing our resilience. The radical left only likes the Green New Deal because it wants to cancel our freedoms. In any case, America cannot act unilaterally on the climate crisis because India and China is something, something, something. Now, what gives this narrative its stranglehold on our politics is that get it, it gets repeatedly invoked not only by oil and gas interests, but also through their use of these seven key terms by scientists, economists, journalists, politicians, and sometimes even activists, all of whom sincerely intend to help advance climate solutions. In fact, the majority of these keywords are sourced from language produced over the decades by these groups themselves. So just as fossil fuel interests weaponized the concept of uncertainty and popularized the, for example, concept of the carbon footprint in order to deflect public attention away from the necessity of government action, so too have they mined the language of climate activists and advocates and researchers for material they can use, extracting and deploying these words in a misleading way to entrap those advocates into unwittingly amplifying fossil fuel disinformation. So these are the kind of systemic discursive actions and reactions that climate communicators need to get better at identifying and coming up with messaging to circumvent. I mean, of course, talking alone won't halt global warming, but insofar as words shape ideas and ideas influence actions, we need to transform our discursive frame systems as much as we need to transform our energy systems. We need to speak with the rhetorical strategies of our opponents in mind so we can stop echoing their languages and reproducing the underlying assumptions of the fossil fuel economy, proceeding as if the world couldn't be otherwise. For the world can be otherwise, and we need to start talking about that new world in order to help.
bring it into being. Really great. Thank you so much. That was so informative and I think <laughs> offered a really, really uh, unique perspective to the way a lot of us normally um, think about and are exposed to these problems. So really excited to unpack some of that in the discussion. And I think it was also a really good primer sort of ending on disinformation to the, the words that uh, the Congresswoman uh, wanted to talk about. So thank you for setting us up for that as well. <laughs> Uh, so I'll just read this. Uh, so to introduce uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, New York 12, first elected to Congress in 1992, Congresswoman Carolyn B. Maloney's career has been a series of firsts. The first woman to represent New York's 12th congressional district, the first woman to represent New York City's 7th council district, where she was the first woman to give birth while in office, and the first woman to chair the Joint Economic Committee a House and Senate panel that examines and addresses the nation's most pressing economic issues. She's also the first woman to chair uh, of the House Oversight Committee and Government uh, Reform Committee, where she is using her leadership to make the climate crisis a top priority. As an original co-sponsor of the Green New Deal and the Northern Rockies Protection Act, the Congresswoman knows firsthand the importance of environmental activism and action. She is currently working to shut down the polluting power plants in Western Queens portion of her district and has held field hearings with Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez to bolster public awareness of this issue. Additionally, she is holding the big oil executives accountable to their contribution to the climate crisis and climate disinformation with a series of oversight committee hearings and additional actions, which is what she uh, recorded for us tonight. And so I'll share this video. And please let me know if you have any issues hearing it. Thank you to the Sierra Club New York City for inviting me to this event and for convening this important panel on climate disinformation. Climate change is a national emergency. We must address it now. However, recent polling shows that only 50% of U.S. voters characterize climate change as a critical threat. In part, that is because of the dangerous climate disinformation online. This is especially true of the oil and gas industries who have spent decades pushing climate disinformation and attempting to make climate change a non-issue. In fact, according to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, these anti-science efforts have hindered the world's ability to combat climate change, especially in the United States. That is why in October, as chair of the Oversight Committee, I held a hearing on Big Oil's disinformation campaign to prevent climate action. During this hearing, we heard from the CEOs of four of the largest oil and gas companies in the U.S., ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell, and BP. For the first time, oil and gas CEOs answered to the American people under oath for knowingly fueling climate change. We also heard from the American Petroleum Institute and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, two groups at the forefront of defeating climate proposals on behalf of large corporations that claim to care about climate change. What we found from that hearing was very alarming. The fossil fuel industry has known for decades that its product is dangerous and fuels global climate change yet it has chosen to, to deny climate science and hide the damaging impact of burning fossil fuels to block climate action. The investigation continues. Last month, I subpoenaed these entities for documents related to their actions on global warming, and I intend to continue this fight to address climate disinformation. Climate change is a critical threat and the Sierra Club and our nation, all of us, must take action now. Thank you. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Great. Okay. So, uh, so that was great. Thank, thank you to the Congresswoman uh, who couldn't be here, but for uh, recording those comments. Uh, and so, I would like to give 
our panelists a chance to respond to any of that, uh, give your thoughts on sort of the way that we can combat these issues, but also to sort of ask a question of each other or, or, or point anything else out. We have about 20 minutes now for questions and sort of whenever you're done asking questions of each other, I'll start moving into uh, other questions, some that I have that I'm excited to ask as well as some that are here in the chat. So Genevieve or, or Jennifer, do you wanna ask anything or point anything out? Oh, I, I, I would just, I, thank you so much, Genevieve. That was an amazing, really insightful um, talk and new frame for, you know, for thinking about how we talk about this. I, I am familiar with elements of it certainly. And, um, you know, that, that, some fear is really important to help people understand how serious this this issue is and i think a lot of people are afraid to even go there because we've spent so much time talking about the doom and gloom and the impacts and there's a lot of fear about generating too much anxiety now um but i think the key is as you pointed out transforming that transmuting that into outrage um, it, someone asked in the chat a question about um, an elevator speech mm. or what's, you know, what's like the short, if you only have a minute or two. Um, and it, um, I want to tell a little story because I was in the car with my nephews um, uh, over the holiday break and it was, it was relatively quiet. And uh, I wanted to talk about climate change. And I just thought, you know, let me just ask them about what they're experiencing. And I said, you know, they live um, in out west um, in different states. And I said, have you noticed any changes? Like, are you guys noticing climate change? And immediately one of them piped up and talked about the 100, 120 degree weather that they've been having in Vegas. Um, and another one said they haven't gotten any snow in the northern Rockies. It's coming much later. And then my nephew's wife from Poland said, yeah, our snow is actually coming much later in Poland as well, even so we immediately had a global picture of some of the changes that we're already experiencing. Um, but now I see in a way that was a missed opportunity because perhaps, you know, a lot of conversations start about extreme weather, but I could imagine an, uh, uh, you know, the little elevator speech might be something like, can you believe the latest weather disaster insert, whatever it is, um, it makes me so angry um, that, and insert someone's name or a company <laughs> who is, you know, preventing us from enacting some insert, you know, policy or change we could be making, which would make our life so much better. Like you could actually convert your framework into a two minute elevator speech pretty easily. That so. is so brilliant. But like, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it. We should all like workshop our own little messages. <laughs> That is, yeah, you know, I've never actually thought about that. And I had imagined it as this sort of like elaborate back and forth in this conversation. And, but you're right. You could just sort of like have a, a rubric. It's like a Mad Lib where you put the, right, right. the extreme weather event, the bad politician, and then, you know, the, th the policy that they're blocking, right? Right. And then yeah. the good outcome. Like, I, I really exactly. Miss, I wish I could have bike lanes in my, you know, in my town. I need them. I want them to, or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so thank exactly. you. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, absolutely. I think that's really uh, a cool idea. And it's something that I sort of wanted to ask of both of you. It, it seems like the two aspects, like sort of merging the two presentations in my mind is the, the importance of framing and also the importance of local and making these issues local. So I'm, uh, and obviously it's challenging for like an activist group, for example, like the Sierra Club to do activism in a way that we are reaching everybody, right? Like we, we it's hard to be local when you're not part of that locale. Right. So how do you have any advice, either one of you or both of you on how we can, as activists, engage with um, people from different areas to teach them about the idea of framing and making their issues local so they can sort of be the ones fighting uh, in the area that they know and know how they're being impacted. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think the important part is to, um, you know, model what you want to see so you can talk about how, uh, 
you know, the harms of global heating feel personal to you, right? Um, and you then you can just ask, you know, train people to ask whether the person they're talking to also feel has those fears or something different. And I love what um, Dr. Marlin was saying about like just asking people what they've noticed. Um, my, you know, my goal is to get people ultimately focused not on climate impacts or not on the natural world or nature, but focused on people so that ultimately this becomes a story about what some people are doing to other people and how we can, <laughs> you know, I know there are technological aspects to this. There are, you know, scientific aspects to this. There are a lot of sort of um, disembodied and, you know, abstract elements to the climate crisis. But I think from the point of view of activism, I think it's the most useful to really try to make this a story about what some people are doing to the rest of us and how we can fight back. Um, Cause you know, everyone loves a good sort of, you know scrappy band of rebels overturns an evil empire. Like that goes all the way back to the Aeneid and there it is on Star Wars, you know and we keep making the Star Wars movies over and over because there's such a deep need I think in our culture to feel that, um, that kind of activism is possible. <laughs> I, yeah, just to build on that, I'm, I'm wondering if that might also apply um, at the organization or institutional or corporate level, because we've asked people, um, you know, are you willing to take consumer action, for example, to boycott or boycott um, companies based on their sustainability records? And um, many people will say, yes, I would actually do that, but I don't know which companies to punish. They just right. don't know who the actors are. Right. And I know there was an article in Grist recently naming like the top 10 villains or something. And so that's increased, that information is increasingly getting out there. So you can focus on the people and the companies because totally. many people are trying to do right. And some of it is greenwashing. A lot of it is greenwashing. You have to be really careful, but there is right. also genuine concerted effort as well. Totally. Catherine, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you, Carl, for putting this together. It's really good. And thank you both Jennifer and Genevieve for your presentations. Uh, I do have a question, Genevieve. I was so fascinated by your uh, talking about the framing and the framing systems. So I'm wondering what can we do to alter or improve or change people's framing system for example, you talked about the seven words, you know, that the opposition uses. So I suppose by not using those words and finding new words, we can begin to change our framing systems. This to me seems to be very key. And I have another tiny little comment I'd like to make, and that's I love talking about what you will benefit from. <laughs> All these health costs, these health costs that people, we won't have those. We won't have the bad air. We won't have... You know, I don't think we hear that enough either. So I, I'm just speaking of myself as a climate uh, activist to talk more about the benefits that will come when we get our desire. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, you know, usually when you get what you want, there's some sort of downside. Yeah, I had that Sunday and now I, you know, now I have to go for like a longer run tomorrow or whatever. Um, or I had that second glass of wine and now I have a hangover. But in this case, it's like you get what you want and you're actually healthier and richer on the other side, but not everybody. I mean, the 1% may not be richer on the other side of this. And certainly the fossil fuel interests may not be richer on the other side of it, but the rest of us, <laughs> um, will certainly be better off. So yes, I mean, you know, sheepishly, I will admit that I am currently writing a book, trying to reframe those, <laughs> those seven key terms um, in a really deep way, not just, you know, really bringing research to bear that will justify, talk, like for example, talking about decarbonization as a benefit for the majority of the world, you know? Um, and also showing why people have believed it was a cost, because it's not just sort of like, you know, that ideology doesn't just float around kind of, you know, untethered from things like the, the dominant economic paradigm that produced much of the economic research in the climate space 
is based on assumptions that, you know, uphold the fossil fuel industry and misrepresent basically the cost of climate damages. So, you know, but they still have have been at the center of climate policy for the past 30 years. So it's like you kind of have to break down the structure that's upholding these assumptions and then, you know, introduce a bunch of research to justify the fact that we need to talk about it. We get to talk about it in a new way. So yes, I agree. I think that there needs to be this kind of framing and I'm hoping that I can at least contribute to that, that project um, with the work that I'm doing now. Thank so, you, Genevieve. You're welcome. Great, so I'll go into some questions from the chat. Uh, so we have this interesting one here. Uh, how do you persuade people to make more advocacy-based behavior change as opposed to personal life behavior change? Uh, for example, making someone's outlet uh, for their outrage to be calling their senator instead of just reusing their water, water bottles, <laughs> though, even though that's a good start. And how do we combat eco-anxiety that might be a barrier to people as well? Mm -hmm. So if, if either of you would like to talk about that. I think this is, um, I think that's a great question because political advocacy behavior is often just so much more, um, it's going to have much farther reach. I think um, in many ways, actions do speak louder than words. Um, I think it's about practicing it, bringing people along with you helping people, um, reducing the barriers to, I mean, just, just as we've learned in all of the get out the vote campaigns, you know, helping people to make a plan, making sure that they know exactly where to go, when to go, like providing all of that information at the right time in the right place and making it more fun, making it more social. Um, and, and I mean, a, a lot of these tactics and strategies we know work, uh, but they take a lot of effort. They take work and they take um, communication um, and they take funding and resources. So um, yeah, I would, I would throw that out there. Yeah, I just want to build on that a little bit. I completely agree that you have to come armed with information and that um, you have to be very clear um, about what people can do. So um, I'll put like for example, um, some uh, someone in the advocacy space who, honestly, I'm so sorry, I'm blanking on actually who created this tool, created a tool called Call for Climate that you can use to call your representatives. Oh. Um, and so you should just have that number memorized, which of course I don't, <laughs> but I have it on my phone and my phone is always with me. Anyway, you should have that number accessible. And so just, give it to the person and then you know downplay how challenging it can be to do political action in my my advice and just say call once a, call once every two weeks and just say what are you doing about the climate crisis you know when is some real climate policy going to be passed you don't even have to like keep up with the political news but just if someone's calling and saying when are you going to do something about the climate crisis that will help and then just in terms of like what about the anxiety that can get in the way of people wanting to take action? All I can say is that, honey, I hear you. Like, really, it, it, it's terrible. The climate crisis is not fun. And I wish it weren't happening. And I feel it too. But the thing that helps me feel both less anxiety and feel good is feeling like I'm, by doing what I do, I prove that it's not in human nature to cause climate change or to be destructive. Do you know what I mean? Even if I don't really make any change in the world, even if I don't actually, you know, help in the end, at least that I'm doing this work is sort of a counterexample to this fear that we all have that, oh God, maybe like, Maybe we can't figure this out, or maybe it's just something in human nature that makes us do this stuff. No, because there are all of these amazing people who are resisting that and doing something different. And we are the proof that change is possible. You know, even if one person can't really fix it, even trying to fix it makes you the proof that change is possible. So 
to me, I feel like when you're talking to other people, it's really important to be compassionate because it is crappy and there's no way around it, but also to just, you know, talk about how it actually helps that. I think both Catherine Hayhoe and Greta Thunberg say that action actually does lead to hope because it means that you embody, you embody it, you embody that hope that we could change, you know, everything. Because as the social science research shows, you actually don't need everybody to change everything. You need 10%, not even 10%, I'm sorry, it's like 3.5%. Is that correct? I'm I'm blanking on the statistic now, Jennifer. A small number. I don't know yeah. exactly that there's a magic percent, but it's a very small number. You're completely right. Yes, it's a very small number of people who act collectively and passionately that can make incredible political change. So, you know, you never know if you're the drop of water that makes the cup overflow. <laughs> And, and just to add a little bit to that, um, I don't know if you've heard the phrase, um, move a muscle, change a thought. But we often think that you know we have thoughts and then we take action. But in fact, in many ways, our brains work the opposite direction. You take action and then you rationalize what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Sometimes you have to just go do, go do something. Just make the call and you'll figure out what you're gonna say once it's ringing. <laughs> right. Totally. All right, here's the number of the call for climate um, thing. All right, it's in the chat. Great, thank this you. This tool will connect you to your congressional representatives and you can just call and say, what are you doing about the climate crisis? I'm really concerned. Fantastic. Repeatedly, they're your representatives. They work for you. <laughs> And you can call co the congresswoman and say that you saw her on our on our webinar. Totally. And, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, there is this other interesting question. I think we have a few more minutes uh, uh, in the chat that uh, I like it because it's a sort of about systems change and somebody's sort of concern about the system. And they're wondering if the speakers could address degrowth versus capitalism and uh, can hope exist in the capitalist framework we have all been born into. Um, I don't know if either of you want to tackle that. It's a big one, but I mean, I, I look to some historical examples of, of gay marriage and things that we just did not think were going to happen because those examples, they, they happened because of that small group of really committed, smart, strategic people. And in fact, deep conversations were part of what made that happen. Conversations from the heart, conversations, challenging assumptions, thinking out of the box. Um, it's, it's tough and I, I don't have the exact answer to that, but I know that we can change more than we think we can change even within the existing framework. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just, um, you know, um, I don't feel really competent yet to talk about growth and degrowth um, with authority because I'm still researching it. But I can say that um, it does seem like the mainstream economics, certainly, and even the climate science that draws on economics, the climate science in working group three that models decarbonization pathways, for example, um, does it hasn't really considered how degrowth might help us decarbonize. And it's a very interesting avenue to explore, especially because, again, degrowth doesn't mean necessarily that most people's lives or quality of life like goes down. In fact, it's the opposite, that degrowth actually means that wealth is more fairly distributed globally. Um, and also, I would argue, in the United States. But I don't want to say any more because I haven't actually, I can't back that up with sources. But, and so, but, so I want to just state though, from my research, it doesn't seem like it's just, it's that the, the dichotomy is between capitalism and degrowth. I think the dichotomy is between um, overproduction 
and um, um, economic sort of fruition. I don't know how I'm going to frame it, but uh, but um, that I'm just going to stop talking now. <laughs> That's, that's really, that's really great. Um, it's something that sort of activists talk a lot about, you know, the idea of systems change, not climate change, uh, but really thinking about that and how that impacts our situation is really helpful. And it seems like the idea of degrowth could really uh, use uh, framing to, to sort of help us understand it. Um, so we're, we're sort of over our time now, we want to end around 815. So in, unless the, the panelists have anything else they, they would like to say, I think we'll we'll wrap up and hand it back over to, to Catherine. And great. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for asking me to be on this panel. I really enjoyed it. And it was so nice to meet you, Jennifer. Of course. Yeah, it was really exciting. And just also, I'll just say quickly to everyone that was listening, uh, we will have this recording on our website. So please, uh, if you have any friends who you noticed weren't here tonight, uh, please let them know about that and it will be on the website soon. So thank you again, Genevieve, Jennifer, um, uh, Carl, and everyone who's on this call, thank you. I know many, if not all of us, have been asking these questions. How do we make a dent? How do we talk for our, to our colleagues and family members? about this issue. And I think starting where they are, as one thing it was said, and uh, Jennifer, you certainly added a lot about people's concerns and what percentage they fit into in that box and uh, into that in that spectrum and think of where they are and how we can bring them from where they are to where they need to be. Um, so there was so much here tonight um, about these issues of framing, of language, of staying positive, of being truthful about the situation, letting people know what will happen if we do nothing, letting people know what they can do, even calling their politicians, I love that, and just saying, what are you doing about the climate? I mean, anybody can do that. <laughs> they don't have to know the bill number or the bill name, just what are you doing, do something. So there was so very many helpful hints here tonight and uh, so much interesting data, Jennifer, that you've been collecting at uh, Yale. And so we've been, given, we've been given a gift. We've been given a gift of raising our efforts and our work as activists toward ending this climate crisis and moving to the world we want and need to have. You've given us so many tools to do this. So I thank you all and thank you everyone for being here. And a big thank you to Sierra Club for having been in existence for so many years as we all continue this work. And uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you those online for being with us and good night.